Bibles and uh, open that with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29. And we're continuing on Sunday night, the life God uses and God blesses, how God shapes a man. You know, when you think about your life and you think about the events and everything that you face in your life, do you ever start connecting the dots and thinking, these aren't random chance or happenstance. These are the divine tools of God used to shape and make and mold my life. I want to read only one verse from uh, the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29, and I want to look only at verse 11 tonight. And uh, with our business meeting, uh, I'm going to just sort of shorten the service, but I just want, to, want you to turn in your copy of the Scripture to Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I want to read that one more time. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God is saying through Jeremiah, he said, I want you to understand that I have some thoughts about you, and there's never a design or there's never a desire in any way, shape, or form to ever bring evil or to bring pain or to bring hurt into your life. Now, if you was here the last time, then you recall some of the principles we went through. First of all, I shared with you that there are some ways that God shapes you and me. You know, the Bible makes it very clear that God shapes us through trouble. You know, you look at Moses, who led the nation of Israel. He faced trouble in his own life. Joshua, who was the next after Moses, he faced all sorts of trouble. Jesus himself faced trouble. You know, Paul the Apostle faced trouble, and you've not lived your life without facing trouble. So one of the ways that God shapes you, makes you, and molds you is not just through the reading of the Word of God, but He allows some trouble into your life. Now, we went into detail about that, so I'm not going to illuminate on that tonight, but you need to understand that God, in part, is developing you through the troubles you face. They're not accident, they're not chance, they're not happenstance, but God in His divine genius says, I'm going to bring you some trouble, I'm going to permit it, and I want to see what you do with it, whether you trust me, whether you turn from me. So second of all, not only does God shape us through trouble, but the Bible says that God shapes us through unusual circumstances. Now, you know, if you stop and think about it, all throughout the Bible there are people that faced unusual circumstances. Moses faced unusual circumstance when he went to a burning bush. Joshua faced unusual circumstances in his life. Paul in his life. You know, and you remember even earlier in, in uh, Moses' life, he was put in a little bulrush in a little a basket, put in the bulrushes, and, and, you know, just some unusual circumstances. Here's what you and I need to understand. God is out to shape us, but he's out to shape us, and the second thing that he does, he uses unusual circumstances. As a matter of fact, some of the most famous men in, in Christianity have been shaped through unusual circumstances, through some of the most dire situations. I heard some woman talking the other day that I was going to have an opportunity to hear a tremendous leading lady speaker, and she's been shaped through unusual circumstances. She survived abortion. And God is shaping her through the unusual circumstance. Her mom wanted to bring death to her life, but God in His divine genius, He has a way of overriding anything and anyone as He chooses. So you're shaped not only through trouble, you're shaped through unusual circumstances, but the Bible also makes it clear, and I shared last time, that we're shaped through our past. You know, one reality that we all face, I shared that we face a past. You've got a past of some type. Every one of us have a past. We have some things in our past, good, bad, or indifferent. And so what God does is He shapes you using your past to teach you trust, dependence, and confidence in Him. And you see, the reality of it is, you know, God has walked with each of us through our past. You weren't in your past without God knowing it. You didn't face your past without God being aware of it. But God knew every single detail of your life. And so the Bible makes it clear. God even told Jeremiah, he said, I have plans for you. In other words, I've got a future for you. 
I know your past. God created time. God created the past, the present, and the future. Do you realize there's no such thing as past, present, and future to God? There is no such thing as time in the, in the mind of omnipotence. He created time in his divine genius. And so God made it clear to Jeremiah. He said, I know the plans I have for you. You know, and so God even realized, Moses realized that God could even use his life in the situation of, you know, he had committed murder. So God shapes us in the midst and through our past. You know, Hebrew 13, 5 says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And so the, all the things that have happened in your life, they've happened in order that you could be, that God could teach you to trust him, that God could grow you, and also that God could use you to be a blessing to others. And then fourthly, I want to deal with this one tonight. God shapes us through test. Now, before God can use you in any tremendous way, and I don't mean, you know, that God can put you in a platform of thousands, but I mean tremendous in His sight. Because the truth about it is, Paul probably never preached to a coliseum of people. Paul wrote letters from a dungy prison, he would talk to the churches, preach to the churches, and he probably would never knew of being in a coliseum and preaching to thousands. But he's impacted more than anyone on the earth outside of Jesus Christ. And so God shapes us through our test. Now, turn if you would with me to Psalm 139 for just a few moments. Psalm 139, 23, 24 says, Search me, O God. And I just want you to listen to these words. Try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Now, one of the things that David knew was this. If I am to be continually used of God, I am shaped through test in life. One thing that every one of us have gone through in life, and I did not like them, and I don't know if you did either, but I can remember in the early years, spelling test. Now, everybody, I want you to learn these words, and on Friday there's going to be a spelling test. And then we'd have a, some type of, uh, spell and B, where everybody would line up next to the chalkboard and, and the best stood to last. And, and I was always a pretty good speller. And uh, I can remember I did pretty good. And me and another girl, Debbie Landon, and I think another guy, Joe Easley, and another one or two, we're standing up there and we're having a spell off. And I don't think I won. I don't remember winning anyway. But, you know, we always have some tests to see how you're doing, to see your performance. And one of the ways that God shapes us is through test in life. You know, David said, I, I want you to know, test me, Lord. I want you to know me and see my evil thoughts. And so there are some tests that God's going to bring into your life to challenge you and to check you. First of all, the test of relationship. Now, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Salvation is far more than just getting saved and getting your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. What God does is this. He doesn't make you develop a relationship with Him. Did you hear that? Sometimes we have this idea that God is up in heaven and He is going to make us develop a relationship with Him. Do you know that's not even in the Bible? God doesn't make you develop a relationship with Him. Do you know what God does? Has it ever dawned upon you that God allows you relationships in your life? He allows all sorts of things to come into your life and He wants to watch and see how you treat your relationship with Him in the midst of everything else that's going on. Is it important to have and to continue a relationship with the living God? Nobody was ever created just for religiosity. You were created for a relationship. And one of the things that God does is this. I'm going to let a thousand things vie for your attention. I'm going to let your children, I'm going to let your job, I'm going to let work, I'm going to let all these things to come into your life, and then I'm going to watch and see what you do with your relationship with me. How many of you could say and stand up before God and say, I maintain a regular devotion time between the Lord and myself. I do it as regularly as I can on on a daily or maybe every other day, but I make sure I get into the Word. You see, here's what God does. He tests us through our relationship. That's exactly what He does. You know, think about it. Those intense situations that God creates in our lives because I'm going to teach you to, I want to see what you do with my relationship. 
And you see, sometimes in, 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 the, in our life, when it comes to uh, the everyday, work-a-day world, Men leave their relationship with their wife. They say, well, you know what? I, my, my, my job just took me away from it. No, it didn't. You had an option, a job or your life or your spouse, your children, and you decided that the, your wife and children was not as important, and you took the job. So God tests us through the area of relationships. And what he'll do is this. Now, I want you to notice what will happen this week. God will let a thousand things come into your life this week. Don't pray and ask God to remove a thousand things so you can be devoted to Him. He won't do that. God will allow a thousand things to come into your life, and He's going to watch to see how serious you are in your relationship with Him. If you go back to the early apostles, the Bible says it, and, I, and I, as I read it, I think, man, we just so missed the mark. The Bible says they were devoted to, to prayer, and to the studying of the Word of God. They were devoted. They continued regularly in that. A lot of times if we read a chapter a week, we feel like we're doing good. But God not only tests us through relationships, but the Bible makes it very clear that God will test us through finances. Now, let me show you what God does. When you receive a paycheck at the end of the week, and he says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Do you know what God is doing? God is saying, you know what? I'm all out of money, folks. I need somebody on earth to help me. I need a little money in heaven, and I need you all to take up an offering because I'm about, I'm about at my, my, the end of my finances, says the Lord, right? That's absolutely foolish. But you know what he does? He tests you. And can I tell you this? I want you to listen. The offering plate is a wonderful test. Amen? It's a wonderful test. You see? This is just made out of wood. Little, little uh, type of uh, design on the bottom. I couldn't think of a word. And here's what happens. Stand. And a person just, you know, or they pass it real quick by down. I never will forget I was in one church and one of the little girls was taking up the offering. I think it was back years ago when Stephanie was small too. And this other little girl, after she took up the offering, she came up to me and she said, did I win? But watch this. God's testing you. God is testing you through your relationships. He's testing you through your finances. And see, here's what we do. We say, pray for me that I need a raise. What are you doing with the finances that God has given you? Because he shapes you through your finances. You know, the Bible makes it very clear. A tithe is the Lord. And so God will test you through the tithe. I never will forget on my paper route, my mom would say, Now, Benny, whenever you get your paper route money in, whenever you get paid, you be sure and you tithe that. And she honed that into my mind and my heart. And I only got $10. And that was, I mean, I, I worked for two hours a day, five, six days a week. And some of them didn't even pay me. And they claimed to be Christians too. I cut them off. Uh, and uh, one lady I could still hear in my mind's eye, where's my paper as I drove by? And I thought, you've milked me out of my last, last money. It shows you how you still remember those things. But God tests us through finances. God, please give me more. Give me more. Okay, what am I doing with the... $200 I've got. Am I faithful? Am I honoring God with that? You know what someone said? What, uh, and I don't know uh, this statistic. I've not researched it myself. But someone said, if everyone in the world lost their job and went on food stamps and tithed, the church would receive a 33% increase in salary. Or 33% increase in, in, their, in their giving. I don't know how accurate that is. But here's what God does do. He tests my finances. He tests yours. And you see, you own nothing. And the Lord says the tithe is His. And so He makes it very clear. And not only that, but the Bible makes it very clear that God tests us in the area of faith. What in the world is faith? Can I tell you as a pastor and as a preacher's son growing up and at home, faith was the hardest thing for me to put a handle on as a young, as a young Christian? Because people would say things like, well, just have faith. And I, I didn't know what they were meaning, and I don't believe they knew what they meant, but they wanted to sound spiritual to me. But here's what faith is. 
Faith is the confidence in another person's word when they give you their word about something. For example, my daughter said, I'm going to be over this afternoon. What do we do? Oh, we've been busy all afternoon trying to get the house ready and trying to get first one thing and another because Julianne's got to have her bed and we've got to get the bed ready and she'll come and inspect it. And if, you know, if it's not just right, mom, mom and papa will get fired and uh, we don't want to lose our job. But, uh, but you know, she, you give your word about something. And you see, you know, God tests us in the area of faith. You know, God speaks through his word. When you read God's word, what do you do? Do you say, well, that's a nice thought. That's not just a nice thought. That is the eternal truth of holy God. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I was in a situation not too long ago, just in the last couple of days, and had something I thought was going to happen, didn't happen. I thought, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know you do. And the Lord just reminded me, Benny, don't worry. Cast all your cares on me. For what? I care for you. And so the reality of it is, is, you know, God can never, you know, do anything great in our life until he develops our faith. And if God's not doing anything great in your life, the issue that you, might have, you and I might have to ask is, what, what is my faith? What is my confidence as God? If I'm not tithing, I, I don't believe God's going to come through for me financially. In other words, I feel like I've got to keep something back because God's not going to come to my rescue. And so, you know, God can never use you in a great way until he develops you in a great, great faith. Confidence in him. Confidence is, I don't, I don't uh, see it, but I believe it. I never will forget Charles Stanley sharing this story years ago when I first started listening to him. His grandfather was a, just a simple preacher outside of Richmond, Virginia. And he said, I never will forget. I had an opportunity to spend a week with my grandfather. That's the only, he said, that's about all my memory of him. But he said, uh, in spending that week, he said, I learned so much from my grandfather. And he said, here's one thing, my grand If God tells you to run through a brick wall, you run at it full steam ahead. What was he telling him? He said, you obey God, you leave everything to God. And that's faith. God, you said in your word for me to do this, and I'm going to leave the consequences with you. So God, test us through faith. Do you believe what I say? And you see, here's what we do. Well, Lord, I believe what you say, but... I believe what you say, but you're just not living in 2015. And so we backpedal. God not only tests us through finances, but also in faith, but God tests us through temptation. You see, everything that's happening in your life, do you see some things that's happening in your life that you can put in the test of relationships, or test of finances, or the test of faith? or the test of temptation, you can look through all that and you say, I see why this is happening to my life. I see why this marker and this situation over here, I, I understand because, you know what, I've just been so worried about my finances. Well, here's what's going to happen. You're going to keep worrying and worrying until you learn to trust, and as you trust, you get off of that worry merry-go-round. And you start saying, Lord, you got my back, you got my back, and I know you're going to take care of it. So he tested through temptation. You know, the life of Joseph in Genesis 37 through 50 is a wonderful example. You remember that story. I won't take time to go back through it and give you the whole detail. But here's Joseph, and here's what, he, what happens. Now, me and every one of you know where you're tempted, and women, you know where you're tempted. But here's what God does. I'm not going to keep temptation from you. I'm not going to keep you out of the world. Because temptation serves a wonderful purpose from God's vantage point. Here's what it is. I want to test how spiritually strong you're going to be. Here's a television show coming on, and it's got some things on it you don't need to see. What are you going to do? Turn the channel. Turn it off. Here's something that I'm going to allow you to face. What are you going to do? And in the life of Joseph, he ran from the temptation. He ran from Potiphar's wife because he knew. What did he do? No, he knew that everything he was doing was in the presence of God. Everything that he did, God was watching and God was seeing. And, and so, you know, here's the thing about it. If you really realize that God is watching you and seeing you and everything you do, then, then that has a bearing on the way you conduct yourself publicly, privately. And so God tests us through temptation. And you know, the reality of it is many fail the test. And the result is they're not used of God. Or they'll say something like, well, God just doesn't want to use me anymore. No, they just cop out. 
They don't want to build a defense. They don't want to stand. And they give in. And then lastly, the test of commitment. You know, the life of those that God has used greatly through Scripture. Look at their life. They weren't great because of some special DNA on the inside of them. They weren't great because of some special chromosome that they had. They weren't great because God said, you know what, I'm going to create you, and I'm going to create you unlike anybody else, and you're not going to fail me. No, because he gives you and me a free will. But you see, they learned the seriousness of commitment. You know, the real reason that so many individuals are lacking in usability and blessability is because of what? Will you be committed? I heard a pastor say this who pastors over on the West Coast. He said, a lot of things we never say in the church because we just don't want to face the big elephant in the room. And that elephant in the room is this, the lack of serious spiritual commitment. Why don't people take Sunday school classes? Why do we have to do so many things? Why are in there, in some cases, so many circuses? Because we do everything to attract people because spiritual commitment has waned low. But what God does is, I want to test you through commitment. And one of those things is being committed sometimes when life is absolutely boring. Charlotte said something years ago, and she never knew I would remember this. But I've thought about it many times and what a wise saying it was. She said, every one of us need to go through boring times in our life to learn how to face life. Life is not always a trapeze act. Life is not always, there's just a, but you know what? Being committed. Being committed. I I have the privilege to visit Luther and Jan and good to see Jan tonight. And 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 as I sit and visit, I sit and think about and why I try to visit them you know, as regular as I can because the commitment, you know, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if it's snow on. It didn't matter if it's raining. There's a few people I always could count on seeing at church. Now, I thank God that he's added, but I'm talking about back years ago. I'd see June come in with her Bible, see Diane come in, see Luther and Jan, see Herbert come in, see Woodrow and Ruth sitting right back there. And see, Marietta, and sometimes I told Charlotte, I said, I'm going to beat them one of these days. I rarely did. But here's the thing about it. You may not be committed, but here's what God will do. He can never use a person in a great way. Now think about it. You're not made for time. God's not going to be able to give you a great sphere in eternity if you've not shown earthly commitment. And some people, when they get to heaven, they say, man, what... You mean if I'd just been committed, I could have experienced that? Yes. You mean that I could have had all of that if I'd been faithful to the fish? I could have had that that serious of responsibility. I could have experienced that? Yes. But you decided that following those in the world was more important. Paul, I hear those words many, many times. Paul is probably one of all heroes of the faith in the New Testament. Paul did not have ease, comfort, or pleasure. He didn't know what it was like. He would have thought that he was in heaven to have a facility like this. He said, I've been rejected by my countrymen. Rejected. Talked about the churches rejecting him, friends rejecting him, family rejecting him. He said, I spent a night in the day. On the city streets of Lystra, he was left for dead after he'd been beaten. And he said, I bear in my body the marks. And those marks were 39 lashes on each time, on five separate occasions, 39 times five, 190 times. You probably would have seen all over his back, scar after scar after scar after scar. But when he gets ready to lay his head on the Orient Way, as he gets ready to be executed. A little bit before that, he's talking to Timothy. He said, I'm about ready, Timothy, to be poured out. He said, I'm about ready to be poured out like a drink offering. But here's what he said. I fought a good fight. 
What that means is I didn't quit. The test of relationship. I could have quit. Hard times came, but I didn't quit my relationship with God. Society changed, but I didn't quit my relationship with God. Test of finances. There's a lot of times I didn't know what it was to have anything. He said, I know what it is to have, I know what it is to be poor. The test of faith. The test of temptation. Are you ever tempted to quit? Are you ever tempted just to throw in the towel and say, you know what? What's it, what's it going to matter? Listen to his words as it comes to the end of his life. I fought a good fight. I've finished. What's the next two words? My course. That means that there's a course for Jan Rose. There's a course for Rhonda. There's a course for Stephanie. There's a course for June. There's a course for Cecil, Marcella. There's a course for K.R. and Bobby. There's a course for, for every one of us, for Christine and for Pam. Paul said, I've, I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I've not abandoned my Lord. I've not displeased my Lord. I've not gone with the culture. Then he says, I want you to listen next. There is a crown for me, which he, the righteous judge, the judge of all the universe, will give to me. But he said, not to me only. When the trumpets sound, the angelic beings sound the trumpet of the universe. And the sovereign calls you by your name. And he says, come, receive your reward. What will it be? Will it be? Can you say, I have been faithful to the finish. I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Would you bow with me?